John Archer of Dos Hombres Cycle, and welcome to the Creative Push. I'm a bike builder in Ocala, Florida. I love building motorcycles, and I love riding motorcycles. I've ridden in 48, uh, 49 states, and uh, traveled most of Canada and Mexico by motorcycle. Welcome, John. Thank you, Sherry. Tell me a little bit about your childhood and how you got interested in bikes. Well, I've been riding motorcycles for 52 years. I got my first bike when I was eight years old, even though I had mini bikes before that. One of my first memories is riding on the gas tank of my dad's Harley around uh, San Francisco in the Bay Area. Things were pretty different then. You know, that's, that's the kind of stuff you'd go to jail for now for child abuse, but he would set me up there with a huge pair of goofy aviator sunglasses and, and ride me all around the Bay Area. We lived in California until uh, I was in my teens and uh, kept getting more and more motorcycles. My cousins, who were older than I am, were both heavily into motorcycles and uh, I idolized both of them being older than me and uh, so you know, anything that, that Bill and Jim do, I, I had to make sure that I could do as well. So from there, uh, we moved to the uh, South uh, when I was in high school. And I finished uh, high school, went on to college, University of Arkansas, Wu Pig Suey. Started building motorcycles uh, while I was part of a like minded social group. And uh, at that time, things were pretty different. This was the late 70s and early 80s. And uh, what we did, we weren't, uh, we weren't vogue like it is today. Being able to build a bike and maintain a bike was a necessity. It was, you know, just a requirement. And uh, if you couldn't do it when you, you couldn't hang, uh, you know, you, you wouldn't be part of the, the organization. From there, uh, I came uh, to Florida after bumming around the country for about a year and a half on my bike and started building bikes here probably in the mid 80s. And uh, my best friend and I, Richard Reed, started Dos Ombre Cycle in about 1992. And we're in the same location for, for 29 years building bikes. I have no idea how many motorcycles that I've built, not a clue actually. And it, it's kind of cool when I'm somewhere you know, especially several states away, and uh, I recognize a bike that I've built, you know, years before, and it's still on the road. It's, you know, it's kind of, uh, I don't know, it's, it's nostalgic, and it's like, you know, extending my legacy all at the same time. Recently, I've scaled way down. I'm being more selective on what I do, and uh, I've moved to a different location. When you were a teenager and you were riding bikes, were you customizing back then, or were you just kind of tinkering and fixing those bikes that you had it's it's funny to think about i was breaking a lot of stuff yeah i tore up a lot of motorcycles when i was younger and, and riding bikes i started riding on the street when i was 14 years old i tore up a lot of motorcycles and when i think back on the shade tree things i did to keep them on the road how actually dangerous it was it's kind of comical to me but you know you're young and you're bulletproof and you know stitches hill up in a month and you keep going did you go to school for any kind of college background? With well, I went to civil engineering school. That really doesn't have anything to do with anything mechanical. And like I said, when I was riding in the late 70s and early 80s, I rode with a lot of guys that helped show me what to do. And, and over the years, I've been exposed to some unbelievably good mechanics. A lot of them aren't with us anymore. The few that are, it's really nice to have them around and, and pick their brain. Tommy Bayman. Yeah, it's... it's uh, I never really uh, did anything like that. Uh, I did at one point in time, though, uh, with two other guys teach a deal called Chopper College, where in uh, three days we showed you the basics of bike building. And what year was that? Probably around 98, 99. Was that in Ocala or was that? Mm -hmm. that yeah, well, we would travel around and to different venues and uh, people would pay way too much money to spend three days, you know watching us drink beer and build motorcycles. But yeah, it, it was kind of a neat gig. It was a lot of fun. I enjoyed doing that for a bit. 
Tell me about your company, Dos Ombres Cycle. Richard Reed and I started building bikes. The, the first bike we built was actually a, a 47 knuckle. And uh, when we were through building it, we were like, well, we needed a name. And we came up with that. And over the years, I've worked with a bunch of different people there, Richard, Ronnie, and, and Roger. And in the past few months, I lost Richard. He passed away in October. And it just it changed everything as, as far as the dynamic and, and what I want to do. When I said I want to be selective, it's, it's more than that. I, I don't want to build anything that, that doesn't turn me on. There's a lot of fads out there now, the big wheel dresser craze with nutty stereos and painted like an Easter egg that does absolutely nothing for me. And it's funny, though, with bikes right now, a lot of the stuff that was cool in the 60s and 70s are coming around again. And, it, and it's a lot like fashion, I guess. All those guys that, that threw away all their old chopper parts in the early 80s, like me, are, uh, are regretting it now because it just brings ridiculous money online. What is the one thing you wish you had known when you got started? I think probably how heavily it was going to affect my life and the decisions I made. I'm not saying that I would do anything differently, but I think I would have viewed very special times differently and, and appreciated how golden they were. When it comes to the builds themselves, is there anything that you wish you had learned early on? Well, there was some trial and error. I, I would dream up something and two pieces or components that weren't supposed to work together. And, and I'd go to you know, great lengths to make them work together. And uh, when it was all said and done, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes you're a hero and sometimes you're a zero. So there was, a, there was some things that I tried that simply didn't work that I would spend way, way, way too much time on. But you live and you learn. What would you say was your biggest failure in building a bike? We, uh, we had a guy bring us a Triumph one time. I, I cut my teeth on British bikes. I absolutely could not get this thing right. It was, it drove me crazy. It is the only motorcycle that I have sent away that was not under its own power. And, but it, it had reached the point where, you know, I, I thought I was going to have to have some professional help mentally because the thing was driving me absolutely nuts. Everything I touched on it, it would, would either break or fail or buy new parts that you know were bad out of the box and so on and so forth. And I, I finally just told this guy, just come get this thing and get it away from me. I never want to see it again. The only bike I've never, never watched anybody ride away on was that bike. So would you say most of your experience with building a bike from scratch, basically, would be trial and error and self-taught? Yeah, and uh, like like I said before, you know the motorcycle community. It's different now than when I first started doing this. And I've got a lot of friends that I'll rely on, Richard Barner, people like that. That uh, if I run across something that kind of stumps me, I'll call them up, or they'll be sure and tell me where I'm screwing up at. Trust me. And what's the collaboration when someone comes to you and wants a custom build? Where do you start with that? Do they give you pictures? Do they rely on you for the whole process? Or how does that work? Yeah, normally uh, people will you know, see something online or see something at a bike show or, or see something that I previously built. They'll, they'll be interested in you know, duplicating it to a certain extent or uh, you know, putting their own twist on it. I've had people come to me in the past, though, wanting me to build bikes that I absolutely wouldn't build for them, not only because, you know, it, well, they were stupid, but mostly I, I was worried about people getting hurt on it. Crazy long hand shift motorcycles that people see some guy riding and they think that they're going to be able to hop right on it after they've got maybe six months of experience or something. And, and I, I just won't do it. I won't butcher anything. If, if somebody brings me uh, an original bike um, as far as paint and, and everything, you know, I, I won't destroy that. It's only original once. And, you know, if, if you bring me a, a bike, you know, regardless of the condition or anything, uh, if it's the way it, you know, left, I, I really don't want to screw with it. But it's, it's getting where there's very, very few bikes like that out there. So there are authentic Harleys 90% of the time, but you customize everything from the gas tank shape to the gear shift? Yeah, it, it kind of depends on, on what you're after. Right now, everybody is going towards a more traditional patinaed bobber look. 
which is cool. I really dig that for a couple reasons. Uh, one, the tradition of it, you know, it's, it's, it's what this is all about. And, and the other thing is, is you can ride them. Yeah, you know, I mentioned before, these people build these crazy dressers that sit, you know, an inch off the ground, and you're taking a perfectly good touring motorcycle and destroying it. And, and they dump crazy amounts of money into it. I mean, you could buy a really nice house for what a lot of these guys spend on these motorcycles, and they're destroying the value of it. So I, I definitely don't want to take an, an old bike, a vintage bike, which is pretty much you know, what I do, and, and molest it, you know, destroy it. I just, I just won't do it. So you're really selective with who you choose to work with as well. Yeah, I'm kind of an asshole about it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I turn a lot of people away. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about your technique. The way I usually do it is I'll, I'll get some idea you know, of what somebody wants. I'll put a little input in it. Uh, a lot of times we look for a donor bike or just parts, uh, we go from there. Uh, I'll mock a motorcycle completely up, uh, sometimes to the point where it's running. But, you know, normally I've been doing this long enough. I can tell, you know, what's going to work and what's not going to work without actually firing it up. Then I'll rip it all apart. We do, you know, all the painting and powder coating and plating and so on and so forth. And then it goes back together. Uh, the whole reason for that is otherwise you're going to run into some problems. You know, run into any kind of clearance or fitment issues that you'll end up repainting a lot of stuff. So you even take into consideration the length of a person's arms and their their height and all that with shorter arm spans and things like that. So yeah. it's comfortable. Yeah. Right. Several years ago, we built a motorcycle for a mutant and... Uh, <laughs> We, the whole thing was stretched, all of it. Uh, I think he's like six eight, maybe, and uh, we we had to accommodate his stature, you know, his physique. It, it was really hard to test ride the thing. I, I was stretched across it like a rubber band. And we go the other way too. I've I've built bikes for you know a lot smaller people, and I, I like doing that. I get a kick out of doing that actually. I've built a lot of bikes for smaller people that they're comfortable on and and they're not intimidated by it which is the big thing, you know, you don't want to be scared of what you're riding, you know, or feel that, you know, you're going to pull in somewhere and not be able to turn it around or, you know, drop it in the sand or, you know, something dopey like that. You want to make sure that people are comfortable with what they're on. What's the strangest thing you've put on a bike or customized onto a bike? A credit card ignition, an ignition switch that worked off a credit card. And as you slid it through the reader, you know, just like you see at any store, it would trigger the ignition. The whole thing was, it was fake. All it was was a toggle switch in there that the, the card would run across. And when, when you turned it off, it would run across it the other way. But Would, would any card work in it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. But he had a special card. That, that was probably one of the strangest things. Yeah. Uh, but it was a lot of fun to make. It was pretty cool. And, and when you ran it through there, a little LED light came on. You're like, yeah, I'm ready to go. How do you come up with the color choices and the style of paint job? Is that also a collaboration between you and the buyer and the paint person? Pretty much. And, and I try to encourage people not to paint their frames uh, any crazy colors. If you change your mind down the line and you wanted a different color, you got to completely disassemble the bike. But the other thing is it affects the resale value. You know, if you build up bright yellow motorcycle with a yellow frame, you're going to have a difficult time getting rid of it unless you find somebody that really likes yellow. And uh, so that's, that's one of the things I kind of discourage. Plus, if you use a lighter color on any kind of chassis component or anything like that, it just shows all the crud and the leaks and, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Because these things leak. It's, it's the nature of the, the business. It's, older bikes are designed to leak. That's, that's how they're made. So you've, you've got to appreciate that. Where do you find your parts? I find a lot of parts from a good friend of mine in town, Richard. I'll, I'll find parts from swap meets and so on and so forth. But it's interesting that over the years that people have come up and offered me parts that they don't even know what they are. If I find something you know, that I think I can use in the future, I always grab it and, and stash it away. But since I've moved to this location, I've, I've gotten rid of literally tons of stuff that I simply didn't feel like moving or I didn't think I would ever use. How long has Dos Ombres been making uh, bikes? Uh, 92. 92. Yeah. And you've been in several magazines. And I have, yeah. Yeah, I've been in a few. Can you name some of the magazines? Uh, well, I was in uh, Cycle Source, an Easy Rider, an Outlaw Biker. You were also on a TV show, I believe. I was on a TV show, yeah. That was pretty cool. What was that? 
Uh, I'd rather not say. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. What does creativity mean to you? There's a lot of times when I look at something and I, I think, you know, if it was this way or if it functioned in this manner, then not only would it change the look, but it, you know, it would change the entire dynamic of, of how it works. Creativity to me is being able to look beyond what someone else has done to either improve it or make it your own. And that, you know, and that includes you know, something completely from scratch. You know, there's, there's really no new inventions in the world. If you think about it, you know, in, in the past hundred years, a telephone's a telephone, whether it's hanging on your wall or it's in your pocket. You know, a TV is a TV. There's, there's been no great innovations as, as far as inventions go. And uh, so basically what everybody does in the entire world is improve upon ideas that are already there. What inspires you to create? Uh, boredom. <laughs> I just feel like I feel the need. If I'm not doing something all the time, it it drives me crazy. And I'll I'll wake up in the middle of the night and lay there and think about something, and literally all night long. Yeah, I I build stuff in my mind, and uh, once I do that, I, I've got to see it, you know. And and a lot of times, what's really rewarding as far as the creativity end of it is to see it in my mind, and then actually. Touch it, ride it, feel it, you know. How many bikes do you have? I'm down a few. I'm down to nine. And have you custom all those? No. No, not all of them. Uh, some of them are, you know, highly alone. <laughs> and you collect not just Harleys, but you also have some scooters and some other things, right? I've got a, a 1930 Ford Hot Rod that I built several years ago, and I'm, uh, I'm working on a 1949 Dodge truck. And in 1949... A Dodge truck was ugly, and in 70 years, it has not gotten any better. It's a really ugly truck. Yeah, I enjoy doing that, and I love sailing, which is kind of an oxymoron to this whole motorcycle thing. How do you find people to come and hire you? Is it just word of mouth? I never, never have. They always come to me. I've never advertised. Nothing. For years, I didn't even have business cards. Yeah, you know, people would, would hunt me down. Do you have a website? No. Nope. So you just use Instagram? Yeah, well, I do, and, and even then, I... It's kind of just fun for me. I put a lot of really stupid stuff out there. Now, do you see yourself ever retiring from building bikes? Probably not. I mean, even for myself, you know, I'll probably always do it. I mean, if I'm physically able, I'm getting older and I'm a little banged up. Tell us about that. How many motorcycle accidents have you had? I had one really bad one. Laid me up for about six months. Changed the way my face looked. And how did, what happened? I had a girl that decided I was going too fast, I guess, and she pulled out in front of me and I T-boned her. I was in the hospital for quite a while. Had to have my face reconstructed and, and my hand put back together. And I've had some other spills. How old were you when that happened? I was 39. And I've had some other, you know, broken bones and some holes punched in me and stuff like that. Did that change the way you ride? Changed my life. That and, and losing my best friend in 95 changed my life. I was a little bit off the rails. and Not so much the totality of it, more along the lines of what you may miss, all the things you can do. It changes the way you look at things. And since the accident in 99, I've, I'm not going to say that I, I ride any different because I, I really don't. I mean, it's, uh, you know, if you look at long haul truckers and they drive a million miles, sooner or later something's going to happen. And when you've ridden a motorcycle as long as I have and as many miles as I had, sooner or later, something's going to happen. It's just the nature of the beast. And, and if it happens to you in a car, you don't quit riding in a car. You know, you, you, you make your own choices. That's where I'm at. Yeah, I, I can understand that. What's your fondest memory on a bike or trip or experience? I rode to Alaska, which was an amazing trip, but I had stopped in Prince Rupert because doing all the planning I do, I, I didn't bring any Canadian money, so I didn't have any loonies. So I stopped at a bank in Prince Rupert. My bike's sitting out front. It's all packed down. And uh, the teller, you know, says, oh, you're riding to Alaska. And I was like, yeah, you know. And, and she said, uh, well, if you're camping, you can camp at my family's homestead. And she gave me some kind of rough directions on, on how to get there. And it was still a couple of days out, you know, from where I was at. The next day, as I was riding along, I started recognizing, you know, some of the landmarks she called for. And it was getting kind of late in the day, and I thought, you know, I'm going to do that. So I cut off the Alaskan Highway, wound up this gravel road 
on top of this hill was an old homestead where the fireplace was there and everything. And this time of year, you know, it, it gets twilight. It doesn't, you know, get really dark. But I, I set up my tent and, and crashed, you know. After riding all day, you usually sleep pretty good in a tent. But in the morning when I got up, the sun was coming up and I could look down the valley a mile below me. And you could see a whole herd of caribou moving down through there. And I, I thought, man, how cool to live here. How cool to grow up here and, and see this. And it, and it was just a fluke that she offered this place to me. I would love to know her name just to thank her for it because that whole day, it was amazing. What do you do when you get stuck with a creative project? I work on something else for a while. <laughs> I'll, I'll fall back and, and work on something. And, you know, there's, there's times you have to abandon stuff. It's simply not going to work. There's other times that if I take a break and walk away from it for a while, I, I usually come up with something. And I, most of the time I have my best ideas when I'm out riding anyway. Something will pop in my head. What do you see in your future? More of the same, but at a slower pace without a urgent need to try to please people that I'm doing things for. If you can't live in my in my time frame, screw you. You know, I'm I'm just gonna do what I want to do. And how long does it take you to complete a project usually? It varies. If I've got everything in front of me, I can build a bike easily in three weeks. And like I said, a lot of times you'll get components that, that don't work together or I'll screw something up, break something. You have to figure the dynamics out. Yeah. What's the longest build you've ever done? Three years. Three years. And what was that? It was Richard Reed's bike that was in uh, on the cover of Cycle Source magazine that took us three years to build. It's kind of an interesting story. It went to a guy in Orlando when he sold it, and then somehow it found its way to England. And several years ago, I got a call from a guy in Seattle that had it. So this thing's been uh, across the pond twice. And found its way back here, which is kind of funny to me, I think. And w what year did you finish that? Oh, man. I want to say it was probably maybe 04 or 05. What is your biggest struggle with building bikes? Time. Finding the time or just time in general? Just time in general. There's never enough. And that's, that's one of the reasons I want to change my focus and, and not be so pressured. Is there anything that you'd like to learn that you haven't learned yet? I'd like to learn to fly. You'd like to fly a plane? Yeah, yeah I'd like to fly an airplane. Although I don't know if anybody would be crazy not to get an airplane with me, but I, I wouldn't mind to fly. If you were to offer any advice to someone starting out on this creative path, building custom motorcycles, what kind of advice would you give them? Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and why is that? Oh, I don't know. It, to me, it's riding the bikes is, that's my thing, you know, and uh, the whole building the bikes and the... The creative end of it is just a sidebar to enjoying riding a motorcycle. It's just the love of, of riding that really kind of drives you to create these. Yeah, it really is. And, uh, you know, people have, have known me all my life tell you that that was my thing as long as I've been on the planet, pretty much. Where can people find examples of your, your work? Google John Archer or Dos Ombres Cycle. There's, there's stuff out there. You can see quite a bit of stuff. And you put a lot on your Instagram page. I have been putting a lot on my Instagram page, mostly just to show off on the world's worst show off. It's been great interviewing you for a creative push. Thank you, Sherry.